<laughs> Figure to have it written down would be good. Yeah, because nobody's online either. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Maybe they just figured they'll watch them. Okay. Oh, one, one person. Are you able to hear and see okay online? can see okay so any questions from last time so so far we have um ac power so understanding all the terminology for ac power and calculations for those terms and then we move to a maximum power which is when you need, oh, I don't have it on this one. We got to 17. Okay, so being able to calculate average power, um, root mean square, complex power, and understanding that the complex power is that VRMS times the complex conjugate of IRMS. And our RMS value, remember, is the ma magnitude over the square root of two for a sinusoid, which is most of the forms that we're gonna see. In rectangular form, you um, can find the real power and the reactive power. In polar form, you can find the apparent power and then the angle, which is associated with the power factor, PF. And PF value is the real portion in rectangular form of the power over the apparent magnitude. Okay. All right, maximum power transfer. So next Monday and Wednesday, you'll watch power maximum power transfer problems. So make sure you understand how to do those. You're gonna calculate the load. It will be impedance. And then you take the complex conjugate, which means you're taking the J and swapping it with a minus J. And then ma power maximum will be one eighth of the magnitude of your Thevenin source. So if that's polar, you take the magnitude portion of it only and square it, and then you take the real part of the rectangular form of the load that you find, okay? All right, filters was understanding the terminology, active versus passive filter. Identify the different um, low pass, high pass, band pass, band reject and then being able to understand what a corner frequency is and that omega is in radians per second units. And resonant frequency was for the band pass and the band reject, that's that middle frequency. And then bandwidth is the location of, for a low pass, it will be up to some corner frequency that would be considered your bandwidth for high pass, it's after your corner frequency would be considered your bandwidth. Bandwidth is just whatever it's passing. When it's passing it, correct. Yep. So whenever it's passing it, so for band pass, it's going to be between those two frequencies. And then for band reject, it will be before a frequency and after a frequency. And those would be considered. So bandwidth is usually like a definitive number. So it makes it's hard to say like band reject has a bandwidth and high pass has a bandwidth because it's more like anything above that. So yeah, so low pass is easy to say that bandwidth because it's a definitive number and band pass is like, okay, I have that range. So it's a bandwidth. Um, so usually I say it's operating range 
instead of bandwidth, just to make it a little bit more clear. But sometimes you need to find that bandwidth um, in future classes. Sometimes you need to find that bandwidth to be able to find that Q factor. So the Q factor was the other term you needed to understand. So for a high Q, it was where it's really narrow and really focuses in on a specific frequency and a low Q gave you a wide range of frequencies. So for this one, the low Q is on the top where you can see like, yes, there's a wide range of frequencies it passes, but ideally you want it to like usually pass at one frequency. So you usually want a high Q. Does the Q stand for anything? Quality, quality factor. Yeah, so it does start for, for Q. Yep, quality factor is Q. Um, Yep, so lots of terminology, but but mostly for the filters, it's the concepts of it. So you're not gonna really have to calculate, just identifying, so being able to make sure you are identifying those. All right. Um, so let's let's start with this example. So in this example, you wanna figure out what type of filter that this is. So in order to find out what type of filter, you're gonna plot what is called the transfer function. So you need to find the trans. And a transfer function is a description. It's your mathematical description, I should say. mathematical equation, V out in terms of V in. So you just need to find your V out equation in terms of V in. So I like to work with S, so I would translate these to be LS, one over CS, and then solving with that in mind. So go ahead and take a minute. Oops. <laughs> LS. And solve this for VO. So you're going to leave V in as a variable in there and solve for V out. No, because this is an extraordinary node. 
So if you were to take the equivalent, I mean, you can take all of those in parallel, the three branches in parallel as equivalent if you wanted to. So you're solving for V out and you leave V in as a variable. Where's the ground on the bottom? I would put ground on the bottom. That's all. Okay, so I'd put a ground on the bottom because I like grounds on the bottom. <laughs> you put yours on the top? Okay, <laughs> you can. You just have to note that the polarity will be a negative. If you find V out with the ground on the top, you have to do a negative of it because of the way it's positive, positive and negative. All right, so what will this equation look like to solve for V out? So there's your equation. So that everybody's on the same page with the equation.
All right, you guys get this? Thereabouts. Thereabouts. <laughs> okay. Um, so once you get the V out equation with in terms of V in, you just divide the V in over to the other side. So you have a quantity of V out over V in. This is this is called the transfer function. So this form here is what you plot. And if you wanted to just put it into MATLAB. This would be the syntax. So you define S as a transfer function um, variable. So you say S is equal to the TF, meaning transfer function variable S. And then H of two will be my equation. And so I put one over 10,000 K times the one over um, two times 30 K plus one over 1,000 or 10,000 K Um, yeah, it would be five over 30 K would be fine. And then, um, you can either write it as one over 40 nano S plus one over 10 nano S, or you can combine that to give you a common denominator for this term there. So this term as a common denominator would be 10 nano S over 40 nano S times 10 nano S plus one. And so you end up with 40 nano times 10 nano S squared plus one. Anyway, okay. Then you do Bode magnitude, Bode mag, H of two, and then you can define the axis or you can play around with the settings to be able to determine what they are on there. So the Bode diagram looks like this. Um, for those that haven't seen a Bode plot yet, this is um, the magnitude on this x-axis. And then the frequency, again, is radians per second. So it's varying every single frequency and showing you what the magnitude would be for each frequency. This is called a log graph on this one, or log axis. So the x-axis is a log axis. So that's why you see that the lines are are not evenly spaced. So these go by 10. So like 10 to the fourth, this would be two times 10 to the fourth, and then three times 10 to the fourth, four times 10 to the fourth, fifth, five times 10 to the fourth, fifth, five, six, each of those lines. So it goes two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, until you get to 10. And then it raises it by, you know, 10 times 10 to the fourth is also one times 10 to the fifth. And so these are each called a decade and decades go by 10. So 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, 10 to the seventh, 10 to the eighth, so on. So that's how you label the main axes on these graphs. So looking at this, what kind of a filter is this? There you go. So band reject. Yep. And so would you say that this has a high Q or a low Q? Or small. Is it small or big? Is it small and big? I think small and big. So it's really close yeah, together. So it's not like a high Q. It's because small. Oh, yeah, she did say that. She said, I do with this. Yeah, yeah. So. This is better in doing its job. Um, because it is upside down. It looks upside down. So you have to look at kind of what the main, like, flat region magnitude would be. And then remember the corner frequencies are 3 dB less than that. Remember, you're looking at the averages or the RMS value. So whatever that value is. So if this is like minus, making a guess, minus 10 dB, 
your corner frequency is actually going to be minus three less than that. So it would be around here, you know, and kind of around here. So this would actually be your whole region. So this would be a low Q. And then these two values would be kind of your corner frequencies on there. Why do those be below this? So 3dB is equivalent to one over the square root of two. So you take whatever that magnitude and you could convert it back to volts per volt and then multiply it by over the square root of two. So remember that the amplitude over square root of two was what we found for the sinusoids for the RMS value. Okay. So one over the square root of two is three dB. So you just take three dB less. Yep. So, so this would be minus 13 dB. So the minus three dB is equal to one over the square root of two. Could you volts per volt. So uh -huh. So that is this equation just from here. From here, I just took those out. So I just left it without doing all the algebra. I just left it without the algebra portion of it and put it in that to plot it. But if I wanted to get a better, you know, so this is a little bit more reduced, but you would still want to get the factor of like taking out that S. So if I was to translate this back into the time domain, I need to, you know, reorganize it and do the mathematical manipulation of it. And in the body plot, you can just use S. Yep. So in the body plot, you can just say S is your transfer variable. Okay. And then it will plot this. So in this case, it actually is a low Q, and then omega naught would be approximately what? What would be omega naught here? Yep. And it, oh, really? Yeah. I'll let you do them in Wolfram. Okay. So on that, can you click like where that omega naught is? And does it tell you the value? Because on MATLAB, it will tell you the actual location value. Like if you click on that point, it will say it's frequency equals. Okay. So in MATLAB, you can click on that 13, like you can hover over it until you get down to minus 13 dB, and then you can see the frequency there. So that would be where you could determine where your corner frequencies were, which is a nice feature of, of MATLAB, but you do have to know the specific syntax of it to be able to plot those. Okay, questions about this? Well, what question did you answer? So this was just to find what filter this was. Okay. And then and then what value of omega naught, which was that five times ten to the seventh? No, it's just that one location that looks like the center frequency portion. Oh, okay. So right there at that point. So this point here. That's w not W naught. And then this would be WC1 and this would be WC2. But they're hard to kind of see there. And then was the high, was the Q high or low? Those were the questions that were asked here. 
All right. Um, Okay, so now we're going to move to Fourier's. So here's our circuit. Um, on this one, we want to find IC of T for the different inputs. So the first input is 10 U of T. So solving this using Fourier instead of Laplace. So um, sorry, I'll give you guys a minute to draw it. Millifarads. So zero point two five millifarads. So what will be your equation to solve for IC of T here, or IC of S, I should say? So we have to do that with Fourier as well. Yep. So with Fourier, you just don't have to worry about the initial condition. Correct. So like it's just the one over C one over ZS or LS. Yep. That's it. So that makes it a little easier. Yeah. So don't have to do initial conditions, which makes it a little easier. Um. I tend to like to leave VS until like right before I want to find the values. So if I was to write the equation here for solving for IC, what would I do? Or what would, what? okay. So um, you called this VC? Yeah. Okay. So what was your equation? Uh, VC is going to be uh, VC divided by or, uh, 0.25 ms. No, 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 not divided by VC times 0.25 ms plus VC over 4k plus VC minus VS over 2k. Okay, so VC times 0 0.5, 0 0.25 ms, and then you said VC over 4k. Over 4K. Yes. Correct. And? Easier. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So there's your equation. And then this is to solve VC. So how would we get IC from this? Equation is going to be our IC, whatever that ends up being. 
Right. Okay. So kind of multiplying these out. So you can solve for VC. So VC combining all of your common or getting a common denominator ends up giving you Yeah, yeah, this would be your VN. So, would So, if you were to do this in the plus, you would do 10 over S. Well, you need to change this to either Fourier or Laplace, whichever one you're going to use. Or we might have to be found the equation for VC. We don't need to plot it on the body. No. So, yeah, that's, I was just yeah. thinking of the steps there. But I realized we're just finding nice that. Yeah, so this is just to solve it using the Fourier. Um, okay, so I see here is then two times VS. Wait a minute. Oh, times 0.25 milli s. So it's VC times that. And then 3 plus s. So the 4k times 0.25 milli ends up being 1. So this ends up 5 times 10 to the minus 4. times Vs times S all over three plus S. What do you think of the times one two five S in top? Where did the where did the two come from? Oh. Four eleven two two. It's four K two two K. Which replaces two four eleven five. Oh okay yeah, that makes sense. But yeah. then how did you get on top? Super times I got it. Yeah. So common denominator of 4K mm -hmm. from this side. Make a common denominator of 4K. So VC is going to be equal to the DS divided by 2K <clears throat> times uh, 0.25 MS plus 3 over 4K, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I heard you right. So, so 4K is your common denominator here. Yeah. So you have 4K times 4K here. Oh, I didn't do that, that's why. And then this will be times two. Yeah, okay. So. Just two. And oh, and oh, you can call it the common denominator for you guys to the other side, okay. Yeah. Okay, you see it now? Okay. So from here, So um, we have to use, for Fourier, we're going to use S is equal to J omega. So your IC now becomes um, IC of J omega. And VS, when you change it over, becomes these delta functions. Yeah. So your VS becomes Where's the plus ten? Ten J ten over ten. J. Both sides by 10. Yeah. So remember when you do it in the time domain, it just translates over to the Fourier domain. So, but it would be 10 and then put that whole thing in parentheses, right? And that's where you would go. 
the tennis pro. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention it's an omega inside the parentheses. That is omega. I guess. That's kind of looked like a tennis pro. I was like, wait, how is that? Is that a better that, omega? That is the great Okay. I'll be more careful with that. Okay, so now we just plug this in for the rest of the equation. So five times 10 to the minus four times J omega. And I'm gonna leave VS on the outside of it and then three plus S or J omega, sorry. Three plus J omega. And now you can multiply it by the 10 delta So you're going to want to watch next week also <laughs> the Dirac Delta function properties. So go and watch those videos. They're on the, the lectures. And the next. You only have to be concerned with, you know, that portion of it. So go through the derivation that I do to show that that goes to zero. And then looking at this, we have um, the J omegas will cancel. So we have five times 10 to the minus fourth times 10. So what is five times 10 to the negative three? Yeah, <laughs> you can do negative three. And then you're really just going to be translating the three plus J omega, which is going to be the E to the minus A T of U of T. So moving that back, this ends up just being five times 10 to the minus three E to the minus three T U of T. And that's your answer. <clears throat> How do we handle the omega? Oh, those don't cancel out. Yep, the J omega is canceled out. So I just did those cancellations. And then this already is in the form that you can match to the table. So you can just do e to the minus 3t. <laughs> Where'd I lose you? Okay. So the 10, 10 pi. Delta function, when you take um, the inverse that actually goes to zero, the integral of it goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're gonna watch in the derivation that I do on the videos. So that portion goes to zero. So you're just left with the 10 over J omega. When you multiply that, the J omega is cancel. And then remember the constants on the top just come out. So that's five times 10 to the minus three. And so you're just left with the three plus J omega in the bottom. Okay. And then you use the transform for that. And that's it. So that's where that came from. All right. Okay. Um, we have a visitor. Oh. So if you guys want, we have a very small class today. They all came on Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we could come back to, um, Wednesday next week or some other time if you wanted to. <clears throat> yeah, Friday. Yeah, the Friday before Easter weekend, you know. So yeah. Um. So if you guys want to be, so we have some people online. Okay, cool. But Chase, did you do a USB? Oh, I do Slow. not. Okay. I have an adapter. Do you have an adapter? Awesome. Thank you. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, usually, faculty and students all carry various adapters at any given time for this kind of stuff. Yeah, you do. That's a slick adapter, too, by the way. <laughs> Look at that. That is cool with the HD. With a lot. Yeah. USBs. Oh, yeah. Okay.
So but while Angela's pulling that up, I can introduce myself a little bit. Um, for those of you guys who don't know me, I'm John Volke. I manage the advisory department. I've been the graduate coordinator of that PhD and master's students for the last several years. Now I have worked into a more of an administrative role, supporting undergraduate advisors and uh, additional programs like at an Asia campus uh, that I'm getting ready to talk to you guys about. Um, for the last couple of years, um, I have had the pleasure to be able to work with the students um, from Korea coming here to the United States. So it's, it's perfect. Then go full size. You can see the second slide here. Um, this was one of our large cohorts. We had about the 20 students last summer came here to visit. Um, Angela's also been a part of that. I think you're in this picture. Angela? I'm not in this one. I'm in this uh, this one. You're in this other one. Though. Yeah. I'll be in this uh, second slide here, but uh, it's it's been a really fun opportunity. Um, this is what's really awesome about my job is I get paid to entertain these amazing, cool students from Korea and take them to Southern Utah. This is my job during the summertime. You know, I get taken on hikes to Arches or to Dead Horse Point. Uh, we went to Zion's Canyon last year. This year we're finally going to Capitol Reef. Um, but uh, it's a really amazing opportunity to meet some really cool and interesting people from Korea. And uh, this upcoming year, we now have an opportunity for American students to go live in Korea. And so we're calling this our sophomore cohort, where students who are in their sophomore year uh, that have some classes available to them, we're specifically recruiting them for this opportunity. And so hopefully the people online I will see this sort of. So. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm trying to get the recording yeah. portion because oh, you're fine. it is, but it's not working. This and, uh, okay. So, but uh, but uh, fortunately, we got to Brian here. He actually went to Korea. And I also uh, brought Ken with me. He's one of our tutors. Um, he's also had the opportunity to do this. Um, now, I would never persuade somebody to do something that I personally haven't done myself. And so when I was a college student, I was in a class just like this, and some professor just said, hey, there's this job opportunity in Japan. How would you like to go work in Japan for a summer? So I signed up. It was a military job. I got paid to fly there, paid for my plane ticket, paid for my place to stay, and I was able to work at Samurai Summer Camp in, in Iwakuni, Japan. Um, you can see this, the cool guy with the great tan. <laughs> An awesome shorts of the 90s. There. And also sporting the awesome... You know, <laughs> a fanny pack of the day. That, but I was able to take the weekend. They have a night boat. Every night that goes between Japan and Korea, you go sleep on this boat and you wake up and you're in Korea. And uh, I did that. I uh, had the most amazing time exploring that uh, different country. You can go to the next slide here. And uh, I've got to see some really cool monuments and see some old temples. Sporting a different fanny pack this time <laughs> with my CD player, Walkman. I mean, I was just living the dream. Um, but what was amazing about this experience going to another country was to be able to increase my knowledge of the United States and its place in the world and how much respect you know, people have for the United States and how much appreciative they are of foreigners. And uh, it's really amazing. It also increased my personal confidence with understanding different languages and being able to interact with other people from other languages. And it was a really cool experience. And if you go to the next slide, um, I had an opportunity to go to a live fish market. Um, this is a mind-blowing experience. If you've never seen this, too. In America, we pay lots of money to go see a fish in aquariums behind glass. Over in Korea, they're selling them. You can take them home as pets. I mean, <laughs> this is a sea cucumber <laughs> that you know, or even live squid. Um, these are actually eels. They're um, peeling their skin off and putting them in this soup. You can go buy a bag of precious skin eels. And am I wrong? Is this no, this is. <laughs> I mean, this is 25 years ago, and they're still doing these live fish markets. <laughs> it, does, it does smell pretty bad, but I think it's an experience you'll never, ever have again in this life. This is really cool, and it's amazing, and it's fun, and it's mind-blowing. I thoroughly enjoy my opportunity to be able to do that. It's something I've reflected on and enjoyed, it. and it's helped me throughout my career to have this whole part of my life to experience another culture, another uh, uh, experience. And so I brought Ken with me. He's gonna talk a little bit about his experiences 
in Korea and uh, and a little bit of his uh, time living on campus as a student. So yes. So hello, I'm Ken Gwart. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the seniors. That's why Carly is laughing. That's why we're we working together. But um, yeah, so I had the wonderful opportunity about a year and a half ago to actually go to the Utah Asia campus and do BCE classes, and it was a wonderful experience. So to begin, the Utah Asia campus is in Incheon, South Korea, which is about 20 miles southwest, give or take, of Seoul, the capital city. And the uh, way by train. Yeah. So I mean. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. You you can get to Seoul from the train, it's great. Um, but I think the biggest benefit that I can think of with the Utah Asia campus, and the thing that makes it stick out as opposed to just standard learning abroad, is that it's a campus that the University of Utah owns. And so it's the same classes, it's the same credit, everything is the same. You even, in some cases, you even get the same like instructors. It's just the difference is that you're just basically located in Korea. So if you can go to uh, oh, the next, yes, yes, yes. Hi. Uh, one other thing that I think is really nice is that when you transfer, when you study abroad from other uh, colleges, you have to apply and do this whole process of like transferring your credits from one college to another. And sometimes they don't, they don't transfer. And so it's like, oh, whatever. You have to go through all the pain of finding what classes can transfer if you wanted to do it through another university. But through the Utah Asia campus, you don't even need to worry about that. You just go and it's all taken care of for you. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And it's the same tuition yeah. and scholarships and Pell Grant like pays for it. Yes. So you know, you know, this is not something that's an additional expense like other global programs. This is paid for through your regular tuition dollars. If you guys live on campus, then going over to Korea for a semester, including the plane ticket, including all the food, including all your spending money, including tuition, all of that is going to be the exact same as if you were still in the campus. So. It's less. It's less. It's less. It's less. <laughs> it's less than the housing here. Yeah, so it's, it's a killer deal. Yes, most definitely. And so very quickly, just to go over the benefits that I got from my experience, um, I think the, the biggest benefit of mine was that I got to explore different places and like become more culturally aware while still making progress towards my computer engineering degree. Um, specifically, I, I got to go during the weekends, I got to go and explore the country and go on all sorts of these wacky adventures. And then Monday comes by, I just do classes and just rinse and repeat that for four months. And it was a, it was a wonderful experience and I got to make friends from all around the world. So if you want to go to the next slide. So just a little bit of campus life, you will be on the, uh, the IGC is what it's called. It stands for the Ancient Global Campus. And essentially, it's this campus smaller than this main campus, but it's still kind of big. It's shared by us, SUNY Ghent, which I believe is Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, and then George, George Mason University as well. And there is on campus housing, so you don't have to worry about trying to worry about like, rents and whatnot. That's a view out of the room, too. Yeah, so this was actually the view from my room in the fall. I just looked out the window. That's what I woke up to. How many, how many, how long was the elevator ride? Um, <laughs> it depends on how many people, people, people wanted the elevator for the room. Yeah, so there's 28 floors in the building, and I think on average, if you're leaving a, a busy time, it can take any work from the steps to get in the top of the bottom. Mm. How are the senior works? Is there just more of them? So, yes, that's yes, there's more women over there <laughs> yeah. in the program. <laughs> The view out is like you're living on this floor. Everybody on your floor is going to be from the same university, so you're not like sharing a floor with people from Sydney and Ghent or George Mason. And for me, at least, there are only like five or six other people on the floor, like that occupy that can carry like 27 people on that thing. Yeah, that sounds about right. And that was the same case with ours. So you have privacy, even though you're living on the floor. Yes, definitely. And you get to also interact with people from all across the world as well. I had a, a Russian neighbor, also someone from England. So that was an interesting experience. This is just a brief overview of the map. So the used building is this one right here. These are the double dorms. And these are the single dorms. But it's it's pretty decently sized. And if you go, yeah, so next to the campus, you have all these fun activities you can go to. There's a, the Hyundai Premium Outlets. We have Triple Street, which is like this three block wide shopping mall. Um, and you're also, like we said, about a 90 minutes subway ride from Seoul where you can do all sorts of things in the capital city. 
And so this slide just contains some photos of my adventures. Um, the middle one's in Busan, which is that same city that John was in with the fish market. This is a, a different view of the city. One on the right is up Triple Street. And so I think the biggest concern for Korea is the language barrier. That's what stops a lot of people. Um, in the 21st century, though, it's not that big of a deal if you have Google Translate or other equivalent translator apps. If you do go that route, a data plan might be something to consider just so you always have access to the translator. Um, English, especially in the cities, is very prominent. So you can see in these signs, there's English underneath the Hangul text. I would recommend at the very least learn Hangul so that you can read the alphabet. It's, it's not necessary, but it makes your life a little easier if you can do that. It's only 24 characters, so it's not too hard to do. So why was it life-changing? Well, going to Korea broadened my viewpoint of the world. And really the, the biggest thing is I got to go on this learning broad journey and still make progress on my computer engineering degree. It was great and I made lifelong memories and I also made international friends who I still interact with to this day. And so I'm going to go hand it back over to John to explain mm -hmm. some more of the administrative details. So do you guys have any questions for Ken yes. at all? This is a good chance to ask a guy who just came back and also Brian feel like we're picking on you tonight. Okay. Yeah, okay. He also had the opportunity to go there. Um, it, it's legend. It is just completely mind blowing. If you've been to other countries, Europe, South America, Asia is just off the charts. Man, it is just freaking awesome. <laughs> it is. You'll never find a safer more friendlier country than Korea. I mean, I really, <laughs> the Koreans are just so and appreciative and so awesome. I, when I visited, I was walking around 11 o'clock at night in Seoul and felt very comfortable, you know, as a single woman walking around. So it was very, it was very safe, mm -hmm. even in Seoul, which is the big city. I'm not, but I heard some of my friends who were, and they were like, they were going to Seoul for the weekend and going party and get drunk. Because they didn't, get like so like blackout drunk that they had to like sleep but they heard they heard uh, stories of other people who had gone over and they like crashed on just the side of the road just like passed out and they woke up and everything was there they weren't robbed they weren't mugged yeah like, it, it's safe enough that you can sleep on the side of the road and no yeah well, I, 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 I took a, a night bus in china one time and uh after that, I, I was very tired and I, so when i got off the bus i just went to a park just slept <laughs> for a couple hours and uh just like a homeless person, um, but uh, and I was surprised that uh, people would came come over and make sure that I was okay and safe, and you know I had my CD player out, and they said, "No, make sure you put this in your bag and hide it so people don't, you know, steal it." Like they were really careful of watching out for me to make sure that nothing bad would happen. It's it's just an amazing, cool experience, and this is not going to a small little campus with fifty people. We have five hundred students there uh, taking these classes. You know, from all over the world, um, a 15 to 1 student ratio with 18 different countries that people are coming through with 49 different clubs and organizations. So you can always find activities and friends. It's really super easy to get involved with the organizations. Um, we talked about this earlier about the housing. It's equivalent to the student housing here. You know, it's very similar cost. So if you're already paying, right? no, no, this is way less. A tenth. It's significantly yeah. less. So also, yeah, a tenth. Yeah, you know, there's a little footnote here that well, that's what I got from the slides <laughs> last year. But it it, it 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 is very reasonable that uh, the the cost of the yeah the bad dorms are like seven. Yeah, it's, wow. it, it's yeah. nuts what's been So, here. yeah, 1100 or 1600 to have a private room and you get that nice view. So it's it's very reasonable cost. Yes. Yes. So, um, but one of the nice things that this is not just our department who's doing this, but global university service, services that's growing this, they are able to set up for different scholarships. And so they have money set aside to help fund students to be able to go over them. They, they're, so we have these different scholarships you can apply to, um, as well as on the next slide, there's also the Korean Society of Scholarships where people are applying. The Korean government also is trying to encourage more Americans to go over there and experience that because it prepares our Korean students. They're gonna, they're already starting to come here, attending their junior and senior year. And so being able to have that kind of interaction, have friends, just like Ken said, he has friends who've been in Korea that are now taking classes here. And so it's a really cool experience. Uh, we have some classes 
this slide didn't get updated from what I tried to do yesterday, but it's pretty close. But, but uh, these are the anticipated classes. I think it was only 3305. 3530 30 is 30. is not going to be taught there this fall, but but, um, but 2280 classes you are already planning to take this fall because now's the time to start planning for that. Why not take them in Korea? <laughs> you can have, take the same types of classes. Um, that are being taught in Korea will be offered uh, both in the spring and the fall. Um, we realize that it's a, a, the deadline for applying for the fall semester is May 1st. So it's a month away. It might be too difficult to try to get in or scrambling or get your parents to support you with that. But if you uh, wanted to apply for the spring semester, there's another classes, a very similar spring classes. We have a, a fall cohort and a spring cohort that are doing that. Yeah, pretty sure that uh yeah the physics, physics for scientists and engineers oh that was wrong yeah fall, and then two uh, is in the spring two is not in the spring okay yeah so, that, but that's yeah, an error too this i got this from the global services and i know we're still, we're still making a little updates to this um we did a lot of well, this guys out on time but uh, if you want to take a look closer at the learning abroad um, website they put together an actual very helpful calculator that can break down all the costs so you can have an informed decision about that. Um, but uh, you're, we're not going to pay for your airfare, so that's something around two thousand dollars you have to pay for, uh, as well as a passport fee. You have to get that, and then your health insurance and then housing. Yeah, but if you have Pell Grant money um, already dedicated that you can use towards housing, you can also incorporate that towards. And housing. scholarships, yeah, what other scholarships you have for next year, you're able to apply them. Yeah, so. Mo most of them, I shouldn't say guaranteed, but most of them transfer to pay for the tuition there. Yeah. And then, um, but yeah, there's a, there's a great website you can look at. You're welcome to drop by my office and get that. Um, but we do have some important dates that if you're going to apply, you have to be able to, we already missed the March deadline for the scholarships, but you can still apply for the spring scholarships. Um, but there is a the passport deadline. You need to start getting on getting a passport by June fifteenth. We have that back, so we can uh, start and the visa process. They they said they're opening up a special one for our students for mm -hmm. a scholarship, so additional scholarship availability. Yeah. So, and so but uh, anybody interested? If, if you're interested, you need to start working on it for this fall right away. And uh, th this is the process. Don't just say, "Hey, this looks like a great program." Oh, I don't have any classes I can take. Look first at the classes. That's your primary reason to go, and then have fun. <laughs> so make sure that the classes you're looking for are there. Then reach out to Sarah Wynn. She's our point of contact. I think uh, Britt, you met with her. Um, I actually had an older point of contact, but yeah. Okay, and then but uh, maybe uh, Brian, you met with Sarah. Was she your point of contact? So yeah, I met with her first, mm -hmm. but then one of the other people I had working with her. Retired or not retired, but she went to different universities. Okay, after so, but but we have this um, contact. Sarah is phenomenal. She'll work, meet with her, schedule appointment with her. I got a little flyer that you can look at um, with more information about it. I think it's worth uh, sketching. We're angry about it, so. <laughs> but uh, Sarah, I've met with her uh, in person. Uh, she's fantastic. She's very eager to support you and help you. Um, and just 